Good morning to all of you and welcome to this first Japan Society webinar concerning COVID-19 and the global uh, crisis. Uh, I'm delighted that so many of you have signed up. Uh, we've got more than 200 people uh, on this uh, video uh, call or video broadcast, uh, we perhaps we should call it. Uh, and uh, that uh, is a very pleasing response, I must say, to <coughs> this uh, situation. These are, of course, extraordinary and alarming times, a time when uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain is in intensive care, when Japan has just declared a state of emergency, when the US President, in a rather typical way, is joining the World Health Organization for, uh, his, uh, for what has happened to the world, and when the global economy uh, is uh, destined I think certain to shrink uh, in 2020, which is a surprisingly unusual thing to happen on a global basis. So I'm delighted that we're here and delighted uh, that uh, we are able to exploit this opportunity to connect together uh, Japan and the UK in a human way, bringing voices from Tokyo with, together with voices from uh, London, from the UK. Uh, allowing us to learn from each other even more than we usually want to. And I'm particularly delighted to welcome today two uh, such old friends as our speakers, uh, two uh, old officers of the Japan Society indeed, Koji Tsuruoka in his evening in, in Tokyo, um, our President Emeritus, as well of course as having been Japan's ambassador in London from 2016 to 2019, and Sir David Warren, Chairman Emeritus of the Japan Society, uh, and of course the UK ambassador um, for the years before 2012, uh, when he uh, then moved to London, back to London. The format today is that each of Koji and David are going to speak for uh, eight to 10 minutes. Um, and of course, as is traditional among, uh, with chairman, I will of course interrupt uh, and send messages if we overrun of time because very important today is to have a discussion uh, and to field your questions. Some people have already sent in questions. Please actively send questions uh, as you uh, listen uh, to uh, the remarks of both Koji uh, and David. And we finish uh, in the end at uh, 12 o'clock. We are recording uh, this uh, whole uh, video discussion for uh, subsequent use on the Japan Society website. It will be uh, of course, edited and improved. Um, additional makeup will be provided uh, for the chairman of the Japan Society in order to make him look better, of course. Um, but also, we will um, want to be able to share it uh, with the rest of our membership afterwards. So, I'm going to ask uh, Koji Tsuruoka to open uh, the proceedings by letting us know how he sees things, government and the public response in Japan. Thank you, Bill, and um, good morning to everyone uh, uh, listening to this uh, uh, web uh, meeting. Uh, very uh, happy that uh, uh, Bill and Heidi took the leadership to convene this uh, important uh, discussion because this is very timely and it affects all of us, uh, including the rest of the world. Uh, I first of all would like to open by wishing everyone the best uh, in UK and in particular Prime Minister Boris Johnson as I understand he still is in the hospital. I understand that his situation hasn't uh, deteriorated and I hope uh, an early recovery for him to come back as strong as ever. Let me uh, mention three points uh, briefly. Uh, I believe uh, there are three relevant issues we need to keep in mind and discuss. First, of course, is uh, how we are responding to Corona, the COVID-19. The second is the effect on the economy. And third, uh, looking more into the future and the wider arena, is the global implication of what we are experiencing today. Now, first, uh, the uh, Japanese response to the Corona threat. You, of course, know that Prime Minister Abe uh, announced uh, the emergency situation 
uh, existing in seven local districts uh, around Tokyo and Osaka and Fukuoka in Kyushu. These have been identified as uh, the megapolis where people do gather more often than other places, but it's been based on scientific finding of uh, what has been the increasing rate of uh, the infected uh, people as well as the hospitalized uh, people. And uh, they've been picked up because uh, there is uh, a real danger that uh, there may be a critical breakup uh, soon. And therefore, this is the time to be more cautious than ever. Now, the uh, Japanese uh, uh, numbers that uh, you see uh, in many statistics uh, is fortunately not as high as many others. The uh, death resulting out of uh, COVID-19 in Japan uh, is still uh, less than 100, uh, which we are uh, very gratified, although one death is uh, uh, more than necessary. Uh, we will have to continue to try to keep this down, but to do, to do so, of course, uh, we need precautions that every one of us, the Japanese and people residing in Japan, must participate. The government has been announcing three uh, points, uh, all connected with closeness, you know, social distancing. But more practically speaking, it is don't move too close, don't go into a closed environment where no ventilation is available, and uh, uh, don't uh, uh, continue to uh, discuss issues uh, among small number of people because uh, that is going to uh, affect and infect everyone. Now, the problem with this uh, uh, disease or the virus is that uh, if, even if you may be infected, you may not be aware that you are. So you have to be uh, uh, very cautious and perhaps even believing that you are already infected and therefore make the caution of not uh, uh, infecting others uh, inadvertently or unintentionally. That's why the only solution to this is reduce the contacts or possibly, uh, ideally, no contacts whatsoever with any other human being. And to do that, you have to stay home. Uh, that is what uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe has emphasized uh, on and uh, on again. But uh, the situation in Tokyo in particular uh, has been rising Today, the new infected number uh, went beyond 140 for the day, uh, which is the highest number that's been recorded uh, in the past. And it, this is uh, an increasing uh, uh, tendency that we are seeing lately in the past week or so. So uh, we are really very worried. Uh, the uh, emergency measure or uh, announcement that uh, uh, Prime Minister made is the government, central government announcement, and it will be implemented through the concrete uh, announcement that should follow from the seven local governments that have been identified as being responsible in implementing those uh, decisions. Uh, the uh, decision, of course, uh, is going to uh, emphasize again staying home, uh, but it will not uh, limit or it will not prohibit people with coercive or enforcement measure. It, more, it is more uh, a system that uh, is anticipating cooperation by the individuals. And uh, this is uh, naturally so because uh, it's a measure that saves their lives as well as the others. Uh, we'll, we can discuss this a bit further uh, with questions later. The second point of the economy was the more important, perhaps, uh, point that the government only can announce. Because the government uh, has announced, Prime Minister Abe announced yesterday, that uh, he will present uh, the diet with a proposal that surpasses the uh, amount of the annual budget, uh, only to be used for responses necessary to meet the economic challenges of the coronaviruses. That also includes uh, more funding for medical and other uh, means, of course. But it also addresses uh, the issue of people who are worried about their own life, 
because you have less clients. People are not going to restaurants or bars in the evening anymore. The travels are no longer existing. Uh, 95, 90% down uh, compared to the same uh, season last year. Although this is the cherry blossom season, people have uh, not uh, traveled. And therefore, uh, the businesses are down, hotels are closed, and uh, uh, traffic is light. So well, there is a real loss of income. And this has been a real cause of concern. And this could also add to a stress, which could cause mental illness to people who are uh, hit by that. So well, Prime Minister announced the two measures. One is the measure that will focus on companies. Uh, this is uh, designed to continue employment by those companies. A five-year grace period loan, no interest rate uh, of uh, 3 million uh, yen per uh, SMEs, and individual operator will be 1 million yen, and all of which could be loaned, and the, the uh, return, uh, repayment will come due after five years and there'll be no interest on that. There are also uh, measures that will allow tax payment and social security payments to be postponed. Uh, well, you have to uh, be uh, eligible to request for those, uh, and those are the measures that are going to be implemented by the local, community, local governments that have been identified, and it will be throughout. So this is uh, the measure that the uh, government has announced and the economy uh, is currently almost uh, uh, on a virtual stop, uh, depending on the industry. Department stores in Ginza have closed. There are many department stores that have decided to close completely. Uh, many of the chain stores uh, that are on the retail side decided to close. The emergency declaration will be effective till May uh, 6th. Uh, so it will be just about ma a month. The effect uh, started yesterday, um, today that is, and then it will go on till the 6th of May. Just one small note on the last point. Uh, this is uh, a very challenge, uh, difficult time for the world. Uh, the uh, coronavirus threat is expanding and those that have been hit first will come out first, but it will continue to expand globally, especially in developing countries. The uh, southern hemisphere uh, will be reaching winter uh, anytime soon, and that is going to be a very dangerous uh, uh, situation. So UK and Japan, both of which are global uh, countries with global ability to address those challenges, I think we should start discussing how we could cope globally in addressing those challenges. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very, very much, Koji. That's uh, a great introduction to the situation and the policy uh, in Japan. Uh, we will follow up uh, very clearly over questions on a number of the points that you've raised, and I'll mention already our friend David Cope, a uh, member of the Japan Society from Cambridge University, who happens to be, as he puts it, trapped in, uh, in Tokyo. And he's pointed out the interesting paradox of our moment, which is that uh, in some ways, the UK, currently people feel they are in a more constrained situation, whereas Japan, it feels freer, that we are, well, it's a sort of against some of the stereotypes, which is, I think, interesting about the social, uh, social uh, uh, emergence and also the way in which the laws have, have been used. But we will follow up with questions. I'm going to hand over now to uh, David Warren um, and ask for your view um, on the UK situation and the global situation. Bill, thank you very much indeed. Firstly, thank you to Bill and to Heidi for setting this up. And Koji, how nice to be in touch with you again. And good to be speaking to so many members and friends of the Japan Society. Uh, here in the UK, uh, like uh, millions of others, uh, uh, we are, I am in the middle of um, uh, what we should not call, uh, I think, lockdown, but uh, enforced social distancing. Um, uh, we've been at home now for uh, about four weeks, um, since just before the government's advice on social distancing uh, became restrictive, which is on the 23rd of March, um, from the point about a week before when uh, the government began to 
suggest strongly uh, that uh, uh, opportunities uh, that people were taking for communal activity in pubs, restaurants, theatres, etc., should now cease, and that those who are in the high risk category should go into self isolation, and others should take seriously the need to go into isolation in order to reduce the rate of transmission. On 23rd of March, um, that advice became uh, more um, uh, restrictive and enforcement began. Here we are now, um, about three and a half weeks further on. Uh, sadly, uh, uh, in Britain, the death rate uh, has uh, exponentially increased. Uh, we now have over 6,000 people who tragically died um, from COVID-19. There is some speculation uh, that uh, the acceleration of the disease may be beginning to slow and that we may reach peak uh, at some point soon after Easter, but I think everybody understands that uh, predictions are uh, uncertain uh, and the expectation is uh, that the current situation of uh, remaining at home is likely to be uh, in force for some weeks, be possibly months to come. And we learned this morning uh, that uh, the decision to re review uh, the existing restrictions after three weeks, which was to have happened at the beginning of next week, will now not be happening. And of course, uh, as um, Bill, you said, and Koji echoed, uh, this week we have had the shocking news of the Prime Minister's own uh, deter deterioration in the Prime Minister's health and we all, I think, hope that he has a, uh, uh, I won't say a swift recovery because uh, I think one thing we are learning about the virus is that recovery when you have been seriously ill takes a long time, but we hope that he is on the mend as soon as possible. Like everybody else who's been at home during this period, but one of the um, uh, points that I've noticed is that it's difficult really to gauge confidently what the mood of the country is. Um, it's impossible really to speculate on the mood outside one's immediate community. Uh, but I sense uh, in Britain, um, and the Queen caught this, I thought, extremely well in a message on, uh, to the nation on Sunday, uh, both a real sense of anxiety and uncertainty about uh, a crisis that none of us have ever experienced before. There is no parallel for what is happening with COVID-19 in my lifetime. Um, uh, that's the last 67 years. Um, a sense of resilience as well, um, uh, but also uh, worry about the implications not only for our health, but for our psychological, social, and economic well-being. Um, there's an awful lot of commentary in the press uh, and more widely about the sort of society that is likely to emerge from this crisis and how in some way coming through this crisis, which we will over the next few months, will validate a different political approach to the problems that the country faces. And my personal view is that it's far too early to begin to make those sort of assumptions about how Britain is going to emerge from this uh, unprecedented pandemic emergency. But the one thing I would say quite confidently, having, having caveated that point, is that uh, we are coming through this with a profound sense of respect for uh, the National Health Service. Uh, we saw that uh, in Britain uh, over the last two weeks with these ceremonial moments each Thursday evening when people come out of their houses to applaud the selfless and courageous work uh, of the NHS, not only the NHS but all the other key, um, mainly but not exclusively, public sector workers who have helped to keep the country running during this period, people um, uh, providing essential local services, the people running the supermarkets who have kept food supplies uh, circulating people doing essential work to maintain the, the threads that bind the society together. And from the health service point of view, it's very hard to see uh, us emerging from this crisis without a deep sense of obligation to the NHS and the commitment uh, that all politicians of whatever party will feel the need to honour to ensure that it has the resources it needs for the future. And one might add to that social care system as well. I'm interested also that we've seen some quite fierce 
debates about some of the underlying principles of the, um, the, the policies which have had to be developed during the crisis. Uh, we've seen a fierce debate, and it's a continuing debate, about whether it's right to send the economy, not just the British economy, but the world economy, into effectively a tailspin um, uh, it, because of the pandemic, which, however dreadful, is likely to affect only a minority of people in the most serious way. And I'm putting the argument not, a, not, not in a way that I personally endorse, but simply to reflect the way in which it's been articulated in some press comment. And the economic implications of the crisis, as Koji uh, touched on in respect to Japan, are very, very serious. They're looking in the group of seven major developed economies at a reduction in the size of these economies of somewhere between 20 and 30 percent over the lifetime, the immediate lifetime of the crisis, uh, with every month that the crisis continues seeing another 2 percent knocked off the size of the major developed economies of the world. And that is not just a, a big aggregate figure, uh, it's an economic impact which is having a serious effect uh, both within national economies and across the global economy, the poorest are getting even poorer uh, as a result of the effective cessation of social and economic activity. And that is a massive, massive price to pay for this pandemic. So there's a debate going on, and it will continue to go on, uh, about what the trade-offs are uh, between the economy and the national health and the health of millions of individuals. There's also in Britain been uh, quite a strong debate, uh, maybe we might see this in Japan as well, about personal liberties uh, and whether it is right uh, to enforce uh, the restrictions in ways which directly have an impact on people's personal freedoms. Uh, and this uh, uh, has uh, been uh, sharpened in Britain by the um, slightly too enthusiastic um, activities of some local police forces in clamping down on individual freedoms to, uh, to take exercise and to walk in the countryside. Um, I, I think that that debate has probably peaked uh, in uh, Britain, um, and the, the reason it's peaked is because I think people recognise uh, that the fundamental priority at the moment in the UK is to ensure that the National Health Service has the resilience it needs to begin to be able to cope with a massive surge of individuals who need emergency treatment for COVID-19 in intensive care um, and also have the capacity to perform emergency uh, health provision um, for um, other people in the population who need uh, support and help at the time of this national crisis. So NHS resilience is crucial. And we're seeing also uh, the beginning of a, of a very sharp debate on what the exit strategy from this crisis is. At what point will it be necessary in order to sustain economic and social activity and well-being um, to begin to relax restrictions? Uh, how do you do that? How do you do that across perhaps different regions of the country? Because not every region is as effective as every other region. Uh, as you do that, um, how can you ensure that this doesn't simply result in the uh, virus resurging, which suggests that it's going to be very difficult to develop a sense of, a, of a, an exit strategy independently of a, a, a convincing testing strategy. Uh, as we have seen, particularly in uh, Korea. Uh, so those debates, I think, are quite, are quite, are quite sharp, and um, uh, it's interesting to see the way in which this dreadful crisis has given rise to them. But as I said, uh, by way of conclusion of my preliminary remarks, I think it's just too early to begin to speculate what sort of country we are going to be after this crisis has passed. Um, there is much um, sentimental talk in Britain uh, of recapturing what people uh, think of as the communal spirit that existed in the UK during the Second World War against, uh, against uh, Nazi aggression. Uh, I'm not certain that this is a perfect guide to uh, where we are going psychologically, not least because one of the things that came out of the Second World War was a greater sense of, of, of collective purpose. And one of the things which is, um, uh, uh, I think, factor of the present um, crisis is 
that we are all finding ways to maintain collective purpose, but forced into our individual homes. So uh, I'm not certain that World War II spirit is the perfect example to draw on, but it does provide a degree of psychological comfort uh, at a time of profound national and personal anxiety. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Again, um, a very, very good uh, um, introduction and overview to the, the, the UK situation. Uh, and um, we'll follow up with, with questions similarly. I want to draw attention to all the uh, people on the call that at the bottom of your screen, um, if you bring the cursor down to the bottom, there's a, a button called Q&A, and it's when you click on that that you're able to send uh, your questions in. Heidi will be uh, taking the questions and copying them into a, a, a file for me, and I will um, read them out to uh, Koji and uh, David. Uh, to respond to. While you're doing that, um, I'll take the chairman's uh, prerogative of asking a couple of questions of my own. Um, and since David and Koji have both um, uh, focused very much on the domestic situation in uh, Japan and the UK, I'm just going to add a question about international uh, things, since you're both of a diplomatic uh, background and a diplomatic persuasion. Uh, Koji, I want to start and ask you about uh, China uh, and if you can portray for us uh, briefly the, the Japanese um, political and public opinion view of this, in this crisis of uh, China's role and China's evolution, obviously in, in terms of information about the crisis, but also travel from China has been a crucial part of Japan's uh, tourist economy, as well as, of course, uh, economic links. How do you see that um, evolving? Is there a negative view of that, or is it back to business as usual afterwards? And similarly, supply, supply chains, is that something that Japanese businesses are really rethinking? And I'm going to ask David an analogous question about the United States of America. Koji. Uh, Koji, uh, you uh, unmuted. There we are. There we are. Good. Oh. Uh, the the, uh, the world post uh, COVID-19 is, uh, of course, not going to be the same. Uh, this will be a new normal, uh, as we call, once you experience something that is very extreme. Uh, the, the tendency, however, uh, of not concentrating everything and being dependent on China alone uh, has uh, already started uh, quite a while ago. And of course, China is not the only choice. Uh, and I'm, mentioned, I'm uh, referring to the supply chain. The Japanese companies have invested heavily in China, as they also invest in UK, as you know very well. And this is uh, to find the best combination of the available resources to produce the most competitive products. So oh, China has been uh, the factory, the uh, Per place where they would be supplying Japan, Japanese manufacturing companies with lots of parts, uh, lots of uh, products uh, that uh, will be assembled and finalized in Japan. Now, because of that, uh, uh, there are, of course, uh, Japanese auto uh, factories that are being now closed because parts are not arriving. And uh, uh, the uh, factories in China uh, itself uh, that has been operated by the Japanese auto companies have been closed as well. And this is uh, the danger of depending overly to a single source on a product that uh, is a, should be available globally. So I think there is uh, an awareness that is growing to have important uh, parts also being manufactured in Japan, as well as other parts of Asia. This is uh, perhaps in the ASEAN countries and uh, uh, surrounding countries of uh, China. Uh, this uh, definitely is going to be accelerated, uh, and this is not anything totally new, because uh, this has been a, an effect uh, of uh, what uh, President Trump has been calling for, or limiting uh, Chinese products from coming in, and uh, the divergence of uh, choices of production sites have been in the minds of the major companies of Japan uh, for quite a while. So I think that is going to be accelerated. Now, emotionally speaking, 
uh, the uh, Japanese uh, public uh, uh, talk or attention on China, uh, I should say, uh, is surprisingly low. Uh, we have uh, seen very few comments, especially lately, uh, when Wuhan is already no longer in the news, per se, uh, any mention of China uh, in any way. It's, uh, it's more or less the media description rather neutral. Uh, there's been talk about uh, the Sino-US drift on uh, who's to be blamed, but uh, uh, not much has been carried, nor attention been given on how China uh, has dealt with uh, the uh, startup, uh, the initial stages of uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, threat. Uh, it was mentioned very early uh, in the stage, the lockdown of the uh, city of Wuhan, as something that only dictatorship can do. Uh, but then uh, uh, it is having an effect, uh, we have heard, and it is not uh, uh, necessarily believed totally, but uh, uh, crises are down. And uh, I just saw in the news today that uh, the transport, public transportation system of Wuhan is now back to normal and people are traveling out. And we'll have to see how that goes. In a way, they, start, they, they were first, so they will learn first and they will experience first. And we need to keep an eye on what we should do, learning from what they will experience. And that, is, of course, is very important. It has to be accompanied with transparency and honesty. If we do not know, we cannot learn. And this is not blaming one or praising one. It is how we all survive. It's a crisis that is global. It is not limited to one country or one people. So we should uh, avoid being emotionally entangled uh, and then not having a decent uh, objective view of what best we could do. Uh, this is uh, where we are in China. The tourists have stopped coming, uh, unfortunately, for the Japanese retail chain in particular. Department stores had been reliant very much on the Chinese uh, consumers coming from uh, China to Japan. Uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, none of them now. And that's why uh, the uh, retail chains have uh, uh, lost their clients and therefore they are closing. Uh, but then uh, uh, there was such massive influx of Chinese tourists at one time. And in a way, uh, frankly, uh, I was in Kyoto about a month ago and the city uh, was very calm and quite enjoyable. <laughs> and people in Kyoto uh, felt the same way. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a silver lining there, indeed. Uh, thank you, Koji. Uh, I will just add one quick anecdote from uh, a conversation I had yesterday about China's reopening, um, where a direct investor, I mean, a, a British direct investor in, um, in China, he said that he's, one of his investments is in a restaurant chain that has a lot of outlets in Hubei province, where Wuhan is. And he said they were already back at around 80% occupancy. Mm. Uh, so that was a sort of a strikingly positive view. That's the whole province rather than the city of Wuhan, but that was strikingly positive. David, um, the United States and uh, where its leadership role and the UK, US um, re relationship in, in all of this, um, in many ways, this has been sort of irrelevant to the crisis so far. Um, more a, a, a kind of a, a, a something that we're looking at rather than involved with. Do you think that's a shame and would you think it'll make a difference in the future? Well, uh, Bill, can I answer that question or we'll try to answer it by just widening it slightly at the start and say I think this crisis has been really uh, not, not just profoundly worrying for all the obvious reasons, but also uh, worrying from the perspective of uh, the relative failure of any sense of an internationally coordinated response. I say that not, not with any disrespect to the World Health Organization and its leadership who've done um, an impressive job in trying to focus countries' minds on the essential uh, measures that they need to take in order to suppress the transmission of the virus, but also, but, but primarily, and this is an American point, because there isn't, I think, any consistent sense of how the international community together are going to respond not just to the, um, the, the epidemiological nature of the problem but the social and economic impacts. We're beginning to see that now um, with 
proposals uh, from the international financial institutions for the developing world who are about to be hit even more severely by the, this, this terrible crisis. Um, and we're, we're seeing a certain degree of, of, of common statement from the, the, the major developed countries. But there isn't a sense either within the European Union, I have to say, until relatively recently or more widely, of a consistent international kind of response to this. And that is partly a reflection of the fact that driven by the United States political priorities and the president's political priorities, the major uh, emphasis has been from Washington on US national interests rather than the US as the leader of the international community. Uh, and we're seeing uh, in all countries, we're talking about the United States, um, a tendency to, to see the crisis through the prism of short-term political needs whether it's to blame the Chinese uh, as a means of helping to shore up um, President Trump's political base, repatriate the supply chains, uh, as we know the senior economic advisors want to do in order to protect US national interests uh, against the danger of, of a threat or contamination from abroad, or whether it's a sense of, of, of maintaining as much control over US healthcare resources as possible to uh, support um, US healthcare needs, which in one sense one understands, but it sends a, a very negative message as far as uh, looking at the United States as the convening power to bring together the international community. So I think uh, that the, it's, it's a worry. Um, and it's interesting to contrast the absence of international cooperation in that sense with the prevalence of international cooperation in the science sector, because scientists, as we know, uh, and um, medical scientists uh, and scientists from all disciplines depend upon effective international coordination. They exist in international teams. The <coughs> race to find effective vaccines, effective antibodies, effective testing mechanisms. These are races being conducted on the, on the basis of profoundly close international cooperation. It's a real example, I think, to our politicians and our, and our, and our technocrats uh, at what is happening in the, in the scientific community compared with what's happening in the, in the political community. Um, as far as UK-US relations are, are, are concerned, uh, I think that's getting a little lost in the wash at the moment, uh, and, and perhaps understandably, as countries focus on their national needs. Before the crisis, um, there was uh, uh, when there was debate about Brexit and um, the implications of Brexit, um, can we remember that far back? Uh, there was the sense that any US-UK bilateral trade deal that might be negotiated after we were out of the European Union um, would have to protect the National Health Service against the probability that US pharmaceutical and medical companies would want to um, play a, a greater role in an increasingly privatised healthcare provision. Um, uh, as I said in my start, I, I, I think uh, that uh, if there was any possibility of entertaining that idea pre-COVID-19, um, it, it, um, uh, it, is, it is now completely, completely dispensed with. Yes, well, thank you, David. I think um, uh, it's so clear that uh, with crises like this, they often accelerate existing trends rather than really changing the world and it sort of accelerated that trend of, of, of a loss of US leadership, um, I think, um, as you've rightly said. Now I'm going to read out some uh, questions from uh, the audience. Um, I, I mean, at first, uh, perhaps a chest, you could both answer rather quickly. Michael Spencer has written, in the UK, concern has been expressed about the extent to which younger age groups have been prepared to participate in the lockdown. News reports from Japan have shown a similar disinterest uh, amongst younger people, in other words, a lack of interest in in uh, participating in in the lot in stay at home. Uh, perhaps both of you briefly uh, say to what extent do you think this is true? Um, do you think that uh, younger people are um, abiding by uh, the rules or behaving differently? And perhaps I'll start with you, Koji, from Japan. I uh, initially, or let's say, uh, uh, turned the clock backwards for a month or so. Uh, I think that uh, description of the younger generation not being really concerned uh, might have been true. But I don't think that holds uh, uh, any longer. 
uh, there is a statistic uh, taken on the uh, infected people by the uh, generation, uh, the age. Uh, the most uh, uh, bulk, the uh, largest uh, percentage of uh, the infected people are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. These are people who are working, and it is probably, I, this, I of course, do not know expert on these, but uh, uh, there was analysis that says these are people who are continuing to commute, to go to work, meet people every day, and therefore uh, social distancing, not allowing them to be in contact with others is absolutely necessary. Now, the age group, the youth, if you say, uh, those under 10 are uh, very limited, uh, the school's been shut down, so uh, the uh, infected uh, uh, people, even including teenagers, is quite limited in number. Uh, the people in the uh, 20s, uh, those you would expect to uh, be drinking out till late hours, uh, the infection rate is not that high. So uh, I think perhaps uh, uh, the Japanese uh, younger generation is now taking a very precautionary approach and I th uh, it is, of course, uh, a general uh, assumption that uh, the young ones uh, are more uh, uh, reckless than uh, the older people. But ironically, uh, the older people are coming out. And uh, I, I do go out uh, from time to time. Uh, there's no lockdown here in Tokyo. Uh, and I see more older people out in the streets than before. Uh, this is uh, totally ironic. Uh, they say, uh, I have to go shopping. Uh, I have to uh, 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 meet some people that uh, I need to today. Uh, there was uh, a television interview today asking a, a, an old lady walking the Ginza streets, and she was saying she has a coupon that uh, will expire on the 5th of May. And she thought, uh, unless she comes out, and make sure that she uses it, uh, she will waste that coupon. That's the reason she's out. And there was no young people around. So uh, I think it's uh, too dangerous to generalize now. In Japan, uh, I see, and I can't generalize this either, but uh, uh, the uh, center of uh, a gathering for the younger people, typically in Tokyo, is Harajuku. Uh, which is near Shibuya, uh, both of which are uh, uh, people, uh, the younger generation comes, uh, not just from Tokyo, but from uh, neighboring uh, uh, sites uh, around Tokyo. Uh, it's now deserted. Uh, there is uh, a small town, uh, this is nearby my place, uh, called Sugamo, and it's called the Harajuku of the older generation. <laughs> that, that's still quite popular. Uh, and the older people do wear masks, uh, and they they are uh, sometimes uh, walking with cane or some trolleys, uh, but but they still come in. So you have to uh, shop, close shops uh, to uh, uh, you know, discourage them from coming out. If there's nowhere to go, they probably will not come out. David, what do you? What's your observation of these younger people? <laughs> My observation is probably not very reliable because I'm, I'm not out very much. But when I do go out um, uh, to, to, to take exercise, uh, I don't see an enormous number of, of people. Um, I see a few young people. And my anecdotal impression from watching the TV news is that it's taken some time for the message to get across to younger people um, that the issue is not whether you're going to catch it, but whether uh, you are going to transmit it, having caught it, but not realised that you caught it. And that sense of reducing the rate of transmission and protecting the National Health Service against a surge of cases. I think that message is getting through and it's helped in Britain by increasing emphasis in the media reporting on the tremendous strain that the National Health Service is under across the country. Um, but there is a point to make about young people, however, however easy it is for, for an Ulster like me to get frustrated about youngsters, um, it, it's a very important point which has been made, for example, by commentators like Max Hastings um, in, in, and, and a number of others, uh, that there is a trade-off here, just as there's a trade-off between economic and social activity and health, there's a trade-off between the interests of the old and the interests of the young. And although at a time of national anxiety, one wants to kind of be as sensitive as possible in talking about these trade-offs, 
there is an interest. There, there, there is a, there is um, a, 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 a trade-off that one has to bear in mind. A lot of young people, a lot of young families don't live in uh, large houses with gardens. They live in small flats. Um, they have to get out of the flat um, uh, with their families in order not just to take exercise, but to stay sane. And so it's one of those difficult judgments that the government is going to have to address and address relatively soon, even if we don't lift the restrictions relatively soon, precisely how do you, do you make the environment less restrictive, more permissive, without uh, increasing the likelihood of um, the resurgence in transmission? I think these are, these are difficult judgments for any government to take. Thank you, yes. Um, uh, Koji, I've got a question for uh, you from Paul Farrelly. Um, which says, uh, Koji-san, very good to see you. In Japan, has the accessible TV news shown in-depth analysis of different countries' responses to aid, debate, and understanding? Yesterday, the UK government admitted it had, it had much to learn from Germany, and I'm waiting, for instance, for the BBC to explore in depth what that is. Uh, so the question, really, that he's saying is, we should all be learning from each other. Um, we in the UK can reflect to the extent to which we are um, really paying proper attention to experience in other countries, including Germany, uh, who are uh, well ahead in testing. How does it look in Japan? Is the Japanese TV news um, paying a lot of attention to what's going on in, in European countries, for example? Uh, yes, uh, uh, there are uh, quite a lot of uh, reporting of uh, how other countries are uh, coping with this uh, crisis. Uh, uh, Paul, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm sure you are also staying home uh, now that you are free, and congratulations for that. Uh, I have been watching the news uh, all along because uh, being home, I have not much else to do. Uh, by the way, I had many lectures, uh, uh, commitment uh, before the corona crisis hit. All of those have been cancelled. So I'm not uh, being able to uh, address uh, uh, the recent situation in UK, so I may, I may not have to follow news as much as I have to, but uh, uh, every news reports what happens elsewhere. But it's not really a deep analysis of how they are dealing either successfully or not successfully. Uh, it's more like uh, uh, a uh, uh, reporting on uh, what the leader said and uh, what is the number, how the uh, medical institutions are coping. And uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure uh, whether the people are really learning from, especially the television and mass media, about what lessons we should be learning. Uh, there's more criticism, as you can expect from the press, that uh, Japan is doing nothing. Uh, everything Japanese government do is wrong, and uh, we should learn from others. Uh, but then we do not know what we should be learning from others when media says we must learn from others. So this is uh, nothing new again. The Japanese press is not being very effective in conveying the weakness of the Japanese response. There's one point that they've been stressing uh, recently. Uh, in the past, they were criticizing how China was dealing, like uh, uh, I just said earlier, dictatorship type of... Uh, enforcement measure accompanying uh, um, restricting human rights and so forth. Uh, and uh, a, about uh, a month ago or so, when things were getting a bit serious, they were saying uh, the government is not a, 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 a responding rapidly enough uh, with the crisis and so forth. And there was criticism that uh, the Japanese government was slow. Uh, now they are insisting, or they are also questioning whether it's wise not to have enforcement measures accompanying the uh, play, plea to stay home, uh, or then uh, close shops, and then without compensation. So uh, it, its uh, uh, focus uh, uh, has always been, and I think this is nothing new, uh, on what government is doing and they always say the government is not doing uh, uh, the uh, good enough job, uh, which I find rather differently in SNS and other media saying government is doing rather well. You could see the number uh, rising, yes, but the volume is absolutely different when compared with the rest of the world. 
especially the deaths resulting of uh, COVID-19 may surpass number 100 today or tomorrow, but it's being contained below 100 till the last uh, statistics was made available. So uh, we are also being informed, Korea, which is a country that uh, uh, has been uh, in a difficult bilateral relationship with Japan recently, has uh, handled issues rather well. Uh, that is being reported. Uh, but then, uh, uh, again, repeating myself, uh, not, no real deep analysis. I think we need, uh, Paul, I think you are mentioning the need to do, to do more research and learn from other examples. Uh, we'd be very happy to share the Japanese example. And one thing, point, sorry, I'm taking a bit of time. The Japanese approach uh, is cluster approach. Uh, when people are found to be infected, then they go where the infection comes from. And the core uh, cluster where everyone who was in the room or in the meeting uh, has been uh, uh, infected uh, is uh, discovered. And then they focus and concentrate on following that up. This is uh, a, a measure that is very uniquely Japanese. No one else is doing that. Uh, so every tracing is done very, very uh, uh, persistently. The people who are infected are asked those questions. That's how we do it. Um, thank you, Koji. And um, I might just follow up directly on that from one, a couple of questions about, which is really about the, um, that have come in that is about the uh, the choice of doing just seven uh, prefectures. Um, and uh, <coughs> there have been questions, of course, about whether it was Japan's government uh, too fast or too slow, but also this question about choosing just seven prefectures. And somebody from Fukuoka has, or it's Ian Ruxton from Fukuoka has said, he wonders why Aichi prefecture was missed out, for example, uh, from prefectures in this, uh, in this state, and why the declaration is very limited. Is that um, to do with the cluster approach in your evaluation, Koji, or is that also to do with economic and social uh, issues? Well, Dr. Omi, uh, Shigeru Omi, uh, who uh, was uh, a, a uh, senior member of the WHO before he retired from that institution, he uh, was successful in eradicating polio uh, from Asia Pacific region while he was uh, in the directorship of the Asia Pacific WHO. Uh, so he knows uh, issues very well. He sits in the advisory committee and he was the chair of uh, the committee that uh, suggests how to respond uh, or whether the emergency should be declared or not. And he appeared on the national televised uh, interview yesterday and he explained why it was seven that has been chosen. And I said a little bit earlier, it's been uh, based on statistics, uh, especially by analyzing the rapidly rising number of uh, infected people. And Aichi does have quite a few number, but uh, of course it has to be analyzed uh, in terms of the population, in terms of the rapid growth of numbers and how oh, it is uh, expected to grow further. Uh, Aichi was not uh, a, in the ranks of the seven. Uh, so uh, Aichi is in a better position than Fukuoka. Uh, Fukuoka was the last one that came in. Uh, the Tokyo metropolitan area, uh, the Osaka metropolitan uh, area, of course, are very uh, rapidly rising. There's uh, lots of uh, human move, uh, and Fukuoka uh, is one that uh, is uh, concentrated as well. Uh, the, uh, you always have press reports saying Aichi has been uh, removed because Aichi is where uh, the Japanese cars are made and the economy was put first before health or lives. It's totally wrong. Everything is done uh, based on science and uh, priority is of course saving lives. Thank you. And I'll, I'll ask David really a follow up that's related to that and about the way science informs public policy um, uh, in our two countries. I mean, which you, you've observed, particularly since you were ambassador during the uh, Fukushima uh, and uh, 311 uh, disaster uh, in Japan, um, but also the way in which government is able to, as it were, make preparations for theoretical disasters. Um, we What's your observation on how the science advice is being followed in the UK, but also 
key question in this pandemic will be how well can our governments prepare for second and third waves of infections? It's understandable that none of us were very well prepared for the first wave, but now we've had the first wave. How will the motions of government exact respond to the science in your, in your evaluation? Well, Bill, that's a very interesting question. Um, and I, I, I have reflected on that a bit from my experience during the Fukushima uh, and tsunami crisis of nine years ago. Um, and I remember at that time, uh, and some others who were in Japan and, and uh, who were involved with um, that uh, terrible disaster, will remember how uh, helpful the intervention of the British chief scientific advisor, Sir John Bennington, was in helping people understand the radiation risks uh, arising from the Fukushima um, uh, accident. And I remember a number of um, Japanese friends in government and out of government saying how valuable it is to have a chief scientific advisor who can, as it were, guide what the official response should be. The point I always tried to make as ambassador in these discussions it, it was that, yes, it is important to have a chief scientific advisor in whom you can have that confidence that he speaks with authority. But ultimately, the decisions that, that, that have to be taken during a crisis of this kind are, have, have to be taken by politicians. And they have to be taken uh, on the basis of an evaluation of policy that covers all the scientific, social, economic, political uh, um, issues that are important. So it's interesting that in Britain, we have had um, government um, ministers making very clear from the very beginning of the crisis that we are following the science as the science uh, leads us in a particular direction. Our policy responses uh, follow accordingly. Um, there was, it was said in the press, although ministers say that this was a simplification, a change of policy at the very beginning of the crisis when the idea that in some way it would be possible to get a degree of herd immunity, as, as a scientist described it, in the wider population against COVID-19, um, which would enable us to get through uh, any second or third wave of virus um, had to be um, uh, radically changed and very quickly um, in, in order uh, to, towards a more aggressive policy of, of suppressing transmission of the virus because the implications of herd immunity would have been so serious for the National Health Service it would have overwhelmed their resources and capacity to cope. Now, ministers say uh, herd immunity was never a, a, a policy. But that suggests to me that at least within the British government, there was a very, very fierce and intense and, and brief debate over precisely what the scientists were saying and how the policymakers should respond to it. And I think we will see this as we prepare for a second and third wave uh, of transmission in due course once we are through uh, the next few months. Uh, the emphasis that you see coming out of the Department of Health um, is on ramping up testing uh, capacity as quickly as possible uh, in order to both to um, test and trace uh, carriers of the virus and in order to improve the statistical database on the basis of which one evaluates or government evaluates uh, what the risks are. So preparing for a second and third wave uh, of transmission, which we clearly have to, I think, and I'm not a scientist, so I'm speaking simply as a layman reading the, um, the commentaries, uh, has to depend upon effective testing capacity. And that was, I think, the, the point behind the, the Chris Whitty, the Chief Medical Officer's statement yesterday, which Paul picked up in his question about what we can learn from Germany, because Germany appears to have had a completely different curve uh, from other Western European countries, and that appears to be um, uh, based on a wider testing base. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm pleased to report to everyone that um, I've been given permission to run on a little past 12 o'clock, so, because there's a lot of questions building up. So um, obviously, people, uh, audience, uh, are free to, um, to sign off, but I will go on um, until 12.15 if, I, if, I, if my speakers permit me. Um, and, um, uh, Martin Hatful has sent in a question, um, which I'm sure we could answer probably in another hour, I think probably a very wide and a very interesting question. There's a lot of speculation about the impact of the crisis on attitudes to globalization. 
whether it will lead to more nationalism and protectionism, etc. Uh, please, what do you both think? Koji, start with you, perhaps. Well, thank you for that question, because that's a very relevant question. And as uh, people uh, like members of Japan society, I think, uh, should really try to uh, keep the trend of the positive and the uh, useful side of globalization. Uh, people can easily be very negative by being very nationalistic. Now, it's very important that uh, uh, the globe continues to cooperate. And as an example, following up on that, the scientific side as well, uh, is uh, a Japanese uh, proposal or offer made to a <clears throat> number of affected countries of uh, providing a drug called Abigan. Uh, this is a drug that we used in uh, China. Uh, it's manufactured by a Japanese company. And uh, it is not uh, proved or uh, uh, a, 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 um, a, a completely a, uh, certified as effective toward uh, COVID-19. But uh, it has had some success. And it's a, a drug that was developed for influenza uh, in before and been used, but it of course has some side effects. And uh, it is in the process of being certified whether it is uh, valuable for COVID-19. And the Japanese government made a proposal that those countries that are willing to join the testing phase of uh, certification are invited to join in in that research and uh, work. And Japan will be providing Abigan tablets for free for those countries that are willing to do that. Germany has uh, volunteered to do that, and there's about 40 countries around the world that will test this, because there are infected patients that need those drugs, and they will be willing to uh, monitor the effect of the drugs after they are pro prescribed uh, Abigan. And this is international cooperation. It is not widely shared, uh, to my uh, disappointment, but it's a very important step. And beyond that, we'll have to develop vaccines because uh, it is not just uh, mitigating or uh, surviving uh, when you are infected. You have to uh, combat uh, the uh, continuing attack from uh, COVID-19. And uh, overcoming those threats, you need a cure. And the final curing weapon is vaccine. Uh, that uh, takes time to develop. Maybe half a year at least if not one year and there is a huge number of scientists that are getting together to do that right now it was uh, proposed in the g7 uh, summit meeting that was uh, through teleconferencing and uh, all scientists uh, in that group i'm sure joined by others are now putting resources to do that some major uh, companies are providing funding to do that and we see this as a very positive side of the globalization. We are uh, um, faced with a threat that all humans are challenged likewise. This is not something that you could say it's somebody else's business. If we can join forces to do this, this will be an evidence that globalization does indeed serve the world. Uh, if we can uh, continue to make that effort, the post-corona world will also continue to have globalization on the positive side. This is what I hope we will be able to achieve. And intellectuals will have to speak up on that. Thank you, Koji, and I completely agree. And um, before passing on to David, I'm just going to read out uh, um, part of a, a question from Philida Purvis, um, which is pertinent to this. She emphasizes that the impact in already in sub-Saharan Africa of the COVID virus uh, pandemic is very severe, compounded by the obviously the economic uh, consequences of, the, of what's happened in the global north. Um, and she says, the, you know, the lives versus livelihoods dilemmas there are even more pronounced. Um, what specifically can the UK, Japan, separately or together do urgently to address the COVID-19 problem in regions like Africa? So that's, I think, a pertinent point to your uh, call for a global cooperation on a scientific and, uh, and a humanitarian basis. Uh, David, let me pass on to you. Uh, and I agree with Philida um, uh, in addressing that very important issue. And as Koji said, it's important that intellectuals have to speak up in favour of, of 
sort of global cooperation that he describes in the in the medical and, and, and um, scientific field. Uh, but it's important that governments should speak up about the value of this cooperation too, as some are. But you know, we're, this is a political question, uh, and politicians uh, who whose priorities are nationalistic um, will exploit the crisis so as to ensure that uh, uh, barriers are uh, put up and boundaries are enforced. We're seeing that in the United States. Uh, I mentioned earlier the arguments um, that people like Peter Navarro and others have made about the importance of repatriating supply chains from China at a time when China is perceived not just as an economic threat, but as a medical threat to the United States. We're seeing in Europe um, leaders uh, like Orban in Hungary uh, adopting explicitly um, aggressive nationalistic policies, um, constitutional policies, uh, in support of um, objectives of that kind. Um, it, it was always said in the political world that you should never waste a good crisis, and nationalists will not hesitate to, uh, to exploit a crisis of this kind, to represent abroad as a threat and emphasize the importance of national, national um, polities protecting themselves. So this is, a, I think this is a very serious political issue for the international community more generally. Now, globalization is, is, has become a, a force unto itself with uh, multinational companies uh, and institutions uh, over the past 20, 30 years, and it's hard to see quite how that could be re reversed, thrown into reverse, even by the kind of radical deterioration in, in the world economy over the next two or three months if the restrictions continue, and in some countries intensify. Um, there are lots of examples which people will draw on to show how, how quickly economies bounce back after even the most grave uh, economic restrictions. So one shouldn't rush to uh, adopt the, the worst case scenario or prediction. But I, I think that there is a, a, a serious risk. There's a tendency in all of this, if I can make a more political point, uh, to uh, assume that um, the, the rather faltering uh, US response to this crisis as seen from the central administration in Washington, the politicians in Washington, I don't mean the scientists or the, the technocratic administrators, but some of the politicians, is a reflection of President Trump's own rather strange personality. I think that's a misreading. I think this reflects a wider uh, nationalistic threat, um, both inside America and more widely. It's a personal view. Uh, and uh, that is, a, that is a, a body of uh, anti-globalization opinion which will survive even if um, uh, Biden, it is Biden, defeats Trump in November. Thank you, David. No, I, I would agree with that point, and I, 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 it's worth uh, adding this that, that point out that the principal supplier of masks to the world is the global multinational 3M, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, as it used to be called, and it has been the subject of a major wrangle over the White House uh, with the White House over over its uh, policy about. Uh, sending masks uh, to other countries, so it's a sort of specific case. Koji um, uh, visually has disappeared from my screen, but I hope he's still there because I'm going to ask him a specific question that Roger Macy. Yes, I am. Oh, good. Um, yes. which, which is really uh, slightly to pick up on this point. Roger point noted that in the Japanese um, government's uh, new rules about uh, travel and entry uh, and exit from the country. Uh, that permanent residents in in Japan were um, told have been told that uh, if they have left the country, they will not be permitted to re-enter um, and, uh, and until um, further notice. Um, he expresses a concern that that denial of readmission to people with permanent residency status uh, could itself become permanent. Um, can you give him uh, any uh, guidance on that and the reasoning behind it? I'm not aware. Uh, first of all, I'm not aware of such a measure uh, being uh, introduced. Uh, um, well, uh, perhaps uh, uh, I'm not in government and not uh, fu being fully informed, but uh, uh, if uh, a measure is imposed on a resident in Japan, uh, that measure should not, should be uh, colorless, uh, no, it doesn't have to be applied to nationalities. Uh, we all live here, 
if you go out, the same restriction applies when you come back. So uh, it is already been implemented. Uh, my daughter was in London, she came back. She is in self-isolation for two weeks. She's a Japanese national, but uh, because she was in London, that's what uh, uh, she was requested to do. And of course, uh, we're funding that. So uh, uh, I don't think uh, there's any rationale in discriminating uh, by nationality uh, where uh, if you have been residing in Japan and you are coming back and you have the right uh, to come back, uh, it should be respected. Uh, I, I don't know. If that really is the case, I think uh, that person should contact the embassy uh, or if uh, he, he or she is in Japan, uh, the local officers should be able to uh, tell him, tell her, uh, him that uh, uh, what the measure is in place. Uh, and if uh, indeed uh, he will no longer be able to come back, although he may have a house and family here, uh, I think he should uh, uh, speak aloud and uh, make an issue of it because I don't think anyone will support that. Good, good. No, I think that's it. That's uh, uh, but of course, I accept that you would not instantly be aware of the <laughs> fine print of, uh, of government policy on this issue, Koji. So, but thank you for your very, your very positive and candid uh, response. Um, I'm going to put, uh, perhaps as our final question, a question um, from Joanna Pittman, which actually um, is in a way unfair because neither of you are economists, but you are both observers of, of public policy but is a very good connection to our uh, following webinar next week when we will have uh, Kawai-san Yuko Kawai from the Bank of Japan in London and uh, Leo Lewis from the Financial Times in Tokyo. Joanna's question is this, what do you expect uh, to be the longer term economic ramifications of delivering an economic support package announced yesterday which is bigger than Japan's annual budget? In other words, really, it applies to both the Japan and the UK exceptional measures have been announced by uh, both governments. Um, we can't even judge what the, the real cost of these measures is because uh, um, they are exceptional. But I wonder if, if each of you could uh, give your thinking about what the long-term ramifications might be, positive or negative, of such exceptional measures. Let's start with you, Koji, and then move to you, David. Well, it's a, uh, it's a matter of priority. If you can't live and survive, you can't talk economy. So life was put first. Fortunately, the Jap Japanese economy can sustain the measures that have been announced. As I uh, mentioned earlier, you don't have to repay if you take the loan for five years. So it, it's a long-term uh, measure that uh, the government has uh, uh, proposed. But this measure has to go through the Japanese diet first because the Japanese cabinet can't not uh, budget itself. Uh, the budget discussion on this uh, supplementary budget will start uh, sometime next week. And the opposition party is already saying, uh, I don't think uh, this is effective enough. And they will have to scrutinize whatever the government is proposing, which means it may take longer time than people are expecting, which I am very dismayed. So it is a matter of putting first thing first. Fortunately, uh, I don't think there will be disaster because of this budgetary uh, appropriation. Uh, Japan can sustain it. And if fortunately, after the corona threat is gone, the Japanese economy revives itself, uh, we certainly will be able to uh, re repay and then uh, enjoy another economic success. So uh, I think much of it is in the mood of the people. Uh, this is an exceptional time. We need to depend on public funding on many things because people are not going out and spend their private money. So uh, it is right to uh, a, a have uh, public funding support us. And then when life comes back to the new normal, Let's go out and spend more. That will revive the economy, and I'm sure we'll be better off. Very good, positive, uh, positive spirit. I, um, David, uh, last word to you. Uh, well, I think Koji is absolutely right when he says that the, there's no alternative, and um, we, we it, the governments have to do this. Uh, the answer to Joanna's question, I suppose, as a non-economist, is 
Uh, what are the implications? The implications are that you, there is an enormous amount of government debt which you are um, building up, which will have to be paid back at some point in the future um, by future generations. While interest rates are as low as they are, um, governments feel less inhibited about borrowing uh, to that uh, extent. But ultimately, that money has to be paid back. And it's clear in the UK that uh, the impressive financial package which the Chancellor Rishi Sunak announced at the outset of the crisis is not enough. We have seen that from the surge in um, applications for universal credit, basic welfare payments. Um, uh, we have seen this morning news that a much, much higher proportion of companies are accessing the job retention support that the government has announced than they were expecting. So uh, this is a crisis on much, much broader scale than I think anybody imagined. Uh, so the, um, the, 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 the scale of this problem is, is enormous. But the government in Britain, the government in Japan, I would venture to suggest, and in any other country, has no choice. Uh, uh, if they do not do this, uh, then they will effectively collapse. They will sacrifice the confidence of their people. In Britain, um, partly because uh, Parliament uh, has been suspended for a longer period of time than would normally be the case around the Easter holiday, we don't have that degree of parliamentary scrutiny and challenge which Koji referred to in the Diet. And while some people, I think, would welcome that and say it's good to get, just get on with it, we don't want too much debate, other voices I notice in the media are saying this is not healthy because parliamentary scrutiny is a good thing, it improves policy, it sharpens those areas where policy hasn't been perhaps completely brought through. We saw that in the response to the Chancellor's initial package when um, challenges from the Conservative Party not from the opposition at that point, uh, helped to sharpen and make more effective some of the proposals that he was putting forward. So there is an, another issue which we haven't really touched on, which is how can you sustain effective parliamentary scrutiny at a time of national crisis and emergency when you don't want to bring large numbers of people together in, a, in, a, in an enclosed space. That leads us into the area we haven't even touched on, which is the sort of technology that we're using today and which is going to affect uh, all our lives professional and social much more after this crisis is over. But the answer to Joanna's question is, um, in the long term, uh, very serious. In the short term, there is no alternative. As Martin Wolf says in financial times, either today or yesterday, sufficient under the day, evil thereof. Yes, no, I, th I think at the risk of, um, of sounding flippant, I would also quote Groucho Marx, who when asked what he would do for posterity, he said, what did posterity ever do for me? Um, uh, you won't just have to deal with the current uh, with the current situation. I think. Uh, now, I I think I must bring this to an end. It's been an excellent, uh, very rich discussion. I'm going to treat, um, and I I apologise not being able to uh, have you answer many of the excellent questions that have been put in uh, on issues ranging from tourism to climate, to teleworking to um, uh, the nature of uh, of. Uh, of uh, the decisions that have been made or what the causes were. And I'm going to treat them as terrific ideas for f the discussions that we're going to have next week and the week after, um, and hopefully for several weeks after that, uh, because uh, many of these topics can be um, addressed um, over uh, in the course of these many discussions. Uh, so I'm going to uh, apologize uh, for that, but say every question has been will be noted. Uh, and we're going to come back to them because this is a, a process, not a, a, a one-off. Uh, but for this one-off, um, as it were, um, we've had David, the privilege of, of, of uh, David Warren and Koji Tsuruoka uh, speaking to us. And I want to thank you both very warmly uh, for your contributions, for being prepared to do it and to uh, uh, sparing the time in Koji's evenings and uh, now David's lunchtime. Uh, and thank all the participants for uh, joining this call. Uh, do send in your ideas uh, for the future. Uh, next week, as I've said, we will have uh, actually the opposite way around in some senses. We will have a Japanese view from London, uh, Yuko Kawaii. Uh, European representative for the Bank of Japan uh, based in London, uh, and Leo Lewis, uh, a, a Brit, 
um, in Tokyo, uh, looking at uh, Japanese business and finance and economics um, for the Financial Times. So we are reversing, if you like, the, uh, the uh, ethnic format, uh, but following exactly the same principle. So I want to thank you all. Uh, do come back again, do send in your ideas, and I will get your questions absolutely answered um, in the coming weeks. Thank you, David, and thank you, Koji, and uh, see you all again. Bill, it's a pleasure. Thank you, and Koji, thank and Heidi, and to all our friends out there. Exactly. Stay safe. Thank you. Yes. Stay well. Thank you.